Ah, the humble Centurion. The backbone of one of the greatest empires to ever exist. A true beacon of endurance, strength, and sheer hold-the-line energy. God, I love this. It's fantastic. Shame we're not talking about ancient Rome, though. We are, however, covering the closest analog for a Roman Centurion or Gladiator or something that Battletech has to offer. Today, we are talking about the Centurion, the mech, where the lore inaccurate version is both way cooler and objectively better than the canon one. Fight me on that. This is a goddamn glow up if I've ever seen one. My boy started looking like this stick bug tall lanky ass dude in the beginning, hit puberty, then put on all that freshman weight, then started lifting once he got out of post-secondary, and now he looks like he fist fights assault mechs for a living. It is absolutely fantastic. This should be the canon centurion's appearance from now on, arm, shield, and all. And I should probably explain what this video is actually about, huh? Today, we're going to be breaking down the mech, going over its development in history, lightly going over its employment in battle, and covering the raw stats of its original production model and some of the variants that came after. We'll also cover a little bit about its game history, like a very little bit on the tabletop near the beginning, so don't expect too much on that. But first, before we get into it, introductions. Generic greetings and welcome to Science and Sanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of sci-fi and all its shooty, stompy goodness to you, the viewer. If you enjoyed the video and weren't immediately set on getting your pitchforks and torches on the opening, then uh, consider leaving a like, subscribe, all that stuff, since every little bit does help fight the YouTube algorithm, especially for a smaller channel like this. Or if you just want to hang out, we have a Discord, linked in the description below. And with all that out of the way, the Centurion. This mech is iconic. It's one of those battle mechs that's old, incredibly old, being around since the earliest days of the original tabletop games and the first versions of that, and having one of the oldest data sheets for the original model. And in lore, it's also an incredibly interesting mech and the situation it was designed in was pretty much the best and worst you could ask for for Battletech. Smack in the middle of the first succession war, so you know it's gonna have one hell of a history. During that time period, there was a massive need for massive quantities of mechs, but also, most of the technology from the Star League was still kind of around at this point, Comstar not managing to ruin everything yet, and the actual succession wars not blowing everything else up, so the Centurion was designed and built fairly well, with a few issues, and in enough numbers that it rapidly became an iconic mech in the setting used by almost everyone in at least some numbers, but most famous as the de facto face of Federated Sons trooper-style medium mechs. After all, why wouldn't the Fed Sons like this thing? Giant autocannon, rugged and beefy, it's perfect for gunning down Capellan light mechs, and beefy enough to stand up to the Draconis Combine heavies, it's pretty much the perfect Federated Sons medium. And over the course of the design's life, the manufacture and development of the Centurion would move to the very heart of the Federated Sons, setting up on their capital world of New Avalon, even integrating multiple Centurion prototype platforms with experimental technology and weapons and all kinds of weird shit that was done in concert with the New Avalon Institute of Science, or NAIS, N-A-I-S, however you're supposed to pronounce that. So to call the Centurion the face of Fed Sun's medium mechs doesn't really feel too out of place. It's one of those designs that you look at and you're like, yep, that's a Federated Sun's design. Even though I think the Enforcer is widely argued to be like the Federated Sun's medium mech, though I think that's mostly due to the fact that unlike the Centurion, its production was never halted or interrupted by its factories being destroyed like our good old Centurion was suffered a little bit of that good old Succession Wars magic. Plus, I'd argue that the Centurion is just a better rounded mech than the Enforcer is. Sure, it can't jump like the Enforcer can, but it carries more versatile weapons because of that LRM-10 it's got in the side torso, and the twin medium lasers while just having more firepower overall. Also, those mechs have a tendency to slap AC-20s in the right arm, which is really, really funny and something that deserves extra bonus points. Also, I just think it's cooler than the Enforcer is. Another interesting difference between the Centurion and the Enforcer, which I am going to reference a little bit in this video because they're very similar mechs and it's a good comparison point, is the AC-10 most models come with. Now, strangely enough, in lore and on the tabletop slash game depictions, they're kind of inverted from what you'd expect in the lore. 
The Centurion is often described as having issues with the AC-10 or other cannons mounted in its arm, requiring a hell of a lot of duct tape and prayers from the mech techs working on it to keep it functioning properly, and to stop things from going wrong in combat, like the gun just jamming and being unable to unstick itself. Yet the Centurion doesn't actually have any issues, quirks, or downsides or anything to indicate that. It's just a random lore blurb. And yet when you look at the Enforcer, it's pretty much the exact opposite, as it's described in lore as being an excellent bombardment platform, laying down heavy autocannon fire in preparation for following assaults, or as suppressing fire so other units can move more freely without being worried about, well, copious amounts of death flying at their cockpit. But the Enforcer has ammo feed problems as a quirk, which means, for anyone who doesn't know, that the Enforcer needs to roll a dice every time it shoots to see if it jams. On tabletop, that's not too big of an issue, but in lore, ammo feed problems usually mean that a weapon system is jamming all the time, and frequently at the most inopportune moments, as things like impacts, shaking, rapid movement, you know, combat stuff tends to dick with the weapon and jam it, forcing a few moments to clear and reload, and pretty much denying you the ability to shoot back. So it's one of those strange things with big sci-fi settings spanning multiple genres and multiple decades where the gameplay elements, lore, and depictions don't really line up for the mechs, they're all just a little offset for some reason. Though, that might just be because the quirk system on tabletop is like, pseudo-canon. From what I remember from the actual game, I haven't played in a very long time, Quirks are like an opt-in thing, game to game, where you can decide to use both the positive and negative ones to increase the complexity of the game and change strategy, but they're not actually required in the rules, so if you're doing like just homebrew whatevers or you're just doing a casual fun game, you don't need to worry about any of those things. So that might reasonably be a cause for a lot of these funny inconsistencies. Anyways though, back to the Centurion's lore, where was I? Something about New Avalon before I went on my tangent and tried to justify the Centurion as THE face of medium Fed Sun's mechs. Uh, oh yeah, something something something, long storied history of the Centurion's development and all the shenaniganery that happened during it. This mech was almost immediately adopted into the Fed Sons when it was first designed. They basically came over, looked at this thing, went mine, and yoinked the entire thing along with all of the factories making them as soon as they possibly could. But due to maintenance and logistics issues with the gun arm of the Centurion, it was constantly undergoing tweaks, rebuilds, modifications, and changes to try to alleviate these issues. Said issues only being exacerbated when the main factory and headquarters of Korean Enterprises, spelled with a C not a K, was obliterated during a battle between the Capellans and the Free Worlds League over the world of Ramen 2. Yes, I know. Haha ha funny, Korean Enterprises on the world of ramen, amazing, thank you Battletech, you're, you're doing the thing again. Now, this factory used to be on the border between the two factions, the Capellans and FWL, the Free Worlds League. Which, you know, during peacetime it doesn't really matter where your logistics and industry is, but uh, you may not want to have your mech factory in enemy territory, or if it has to be in enemy territory, maybe. Just saying, you don't want to put it on one of the border worlds that's going to be the first to eat a nuke when the fighting starts. So once that was reduced to dust, Korean Enterprises continued to produce spare parts and components for a few hundred years from a number of secondary locations, keeping the design alive, but just barely. Centurions were slowly whittled away over the course of the succession wars, a leg blown off here, a side torso cord out there, and no ability to really replace or repair the chassis and body of the mech once it was damaged beyond the ability for field mech techs to handle. Eventually, it got so bad that the Fed Sons were considering retiring the mech entirely and phasing it out in favor of the Enforcer, which at this point in the timeline was actually ramping up production and beginning to fill in a lot of the gaps in the Federated Sons medium mech lines. Luckily though, at least by my opinion, our favorite force of capitalism came in to save this bad boy. Massive, overreaching corporate lobbying in government dramatically changing public policy. Wonderful. Korean Enterprises pushed hard to keep the mech in service, essentially promising that they would rebuild a mech factory, reinvent the mech, make newer, better, bigger variants, and produce them all domestically from new factories in Fed Sun territory. 
And I just want to say, this is an amazing deal from an in-universe perspective. Like, I can understand why the Fed Sons basically completely stopped their military planning that they were going through and were like, okay, give them a chance. Because the Fed Sons are chronically under-industrialized and overpopulated in terms of raw manpower. That's one of the reasons why the Fedcom Alliance was so powerful and wiped the floor with everyone else, because suddenly the Lyrans had the manpower and competent generals, while the Fed Sons had the industry and mechs to just YOLO roll over all three of the other successor states and just win in a straight up fight. So Korean Enterprise offering to build a whole ass mech factory for them alone on the capital world was a massive win, like win a free milkshake level of win but offering to update and modernize one of the most rugged and long-serving medium mechs that the Suns had, cherry on top. Also offering to invent new versions and new technology and stuff, highly unlikely, but if they pulled it off, then the Fed Suns just found a gold bar stuck to the bottom of their milkshake glass as well. So of course they agreed, and Korean Enterprises, for the most part, followed through on most of their claims. So once Korean Enterprises got themselves set up and back in the business of actually building mechs around the early 3010s, they set about making good on their promises. The first thing they did was spend shitloads of time to redesign and rework the autocannon arm, fixing the incredibly high self-inflicted attrition rate issues that mech techs working on Centurion suffered from. Because I imagine when you have to spend 27 hours a day maintaining the guns on just these mechs, you're probably going to be racing to the end of your life very quickly at the bottom of a bottle or the end of a barrel. This made the design a lot more friendly to work on and drastically increased its performance on long campaigns with only minimal maintenance and downtime required. Next, they set about improving the weapons and technologies by including as much lost tech and SLDF stuff as they possibly could after the recovery of the Helm Memory Core, resulting in the Centurion 9D variant of the mech. The successes of these redesigns and new models catapulted the Centurion back to the forefront of mech procurement and use for the Federated Sons and later the Federated Commonwealth, which officially adopted the mech. The interest was so great, in fact, by pretty much everyone that could afford to buy a mech, that Korean Enterprise's gamble paid off big time. Despite the presumably billions spent on research and development to fix the old 9A versions, the tens of billions put into designing new models entirely and integrating a whole bunch of new tech, and also, probably, the hundreds of billions total spent on building a brand new mech factory, their sales of the Centurion so vastly exceeded their expectations that they actually had to start contracting other companies to take over some of the load. Most notably, Jalistair Aerospace, who would produce the older 9A models and refit the design until Korean could fully bring production of the 9D online. When the clans invaded, however, as they do in every good story about mechs in this setting, the Centurion proved to be a highly sought-after design, as the heavy armor, high firepower, and flexible loadouts of the mech meant it suffered less against the clan than most other contemporary mechs by tonnage did. And in the years after, the mech would become what I can... what I can only really describe as a giant ball of what the fuck. Those various tech programs and research projects working with the new Avalon Institute of Science had yielded a number of new models that could do everything from carrying Gauss rifles and heavy missile loadouts, to running at over 120 km per hour just because, to carrying rotary autocannons, plasma rifles, and jump jets, sometimes all at once, to making a hilarious Solaris gladiator mech called the Yenlo Wang. And before you ask, no, there will not be any Wang jokes. I had to work really hard to avoid putting them into this script. And in the decades after, heading into the Dark Ages of the Jihad and beyond, the Centurion became one of the most ubiquitous mechs in the setting, having multiple factories built across the inner sphere and out into the periphery, where dozens of different variants of the mech would be created to fit pretty much every niche and need imaginable for a 50-ton mech. 
In my opinion, this is a testament to the titanium solid frame of a mech the Centurion is. It's just a really, really well-built machine that's really flexible, really rugged, and surprisingly cheap for what you get out of it. Hence why everything from periphery militias to pirates to mercenary companies big and small to the main armies of the great houses use them in huge numbers because there's literally no way that you could go wrong with buying this mech. It does everything you need it to do. There was even a project to make the Centurion 11, an Omni-mech design that improved on almost everything about the mech while incorporating a bunch of clan tech. But that's probably going to be reserved for a separate Innersphere Omni-mech episode because holy hell, man, Innersphere Omni-mechs, oh my god. Talk about cursed chaos. Jesus. And before we get into the technical details and readout of the various different models of the Centurion, let's talk a little bit about how it was actually employed and why it was so useful. And first and foremost, well, it's a brick shithouse of a mech. It's really heavily armored, it was very good at frontline fighting and brawling, and it was an excellent choice when you needed a medium mech that was reasonably cheap to fill the role of a heavy mech running up into combat, punching the enemy in the teeth, and taking enough hits while surviving all the way back to base. And though the Centurion would go on to occupy a very front and center mainline combat role, it wasn't actually intended for that originally. It was supposed to be paired as a sort of duo mech alongside the catapult, serving as its protection and escort almost, so that the heavily LRM artillery-focused style of the catapult mech wouldn't find itself being run down and murdered by any random light mech that managed to get around beside or behind it. This is actually one of the reasons that the Centurion has such a diverse weapons loadout. LRMs, medium lasers, and a large autocannon. If they found a random light mech yoloing at your backline artillery forces, then the Centurion could pepper them with missiles to either do damage on their way in or successfully ward them off and get that annoying little bugger to just leave, go away, cease to be. And if they did manage to close in, the Centurion was equipped with multiple medium lasers facing forwards and backwards so that it could always keep guns on target for those little shits, and the autocannon was often more than powerful enough to rip legs off, do severe damage, or thoroughly convince a light mech pilot that they should be pretty much anywhere but here. And as it turns out, such a flexible and useful weapons loadout meant that the Centurion would perform really, really well in proper outright combat. And while initially it was attempted to keep them paired off together with the Catapult, this became a bigger and bigger issue as the Centurion is really, really slow. The mech that it was supposed to be guarding is capable of outrunning it by around 30 kilometers per hour, which is a bit of a hassle to keep up with, because it either means that your escorting target, the thing you're trying to protect, is not going to have its escort for very long, or it's going to have to intentionally gimp its own mobility in order to stay with the big slugger in back that's supposed to be protecting it. And so the Centurion became a trooper, or I guess fell into the role of a trooper mech over time, and for people who don't really know what that means, a trooper generally just describes a mech in the setting that is kind of idiot-proof. Like, you could stick an average mech warrior in it and they would be mostly fine in pretty much any engagement. They've got a decent to high amount of armor for their weight class, they are generalists, which means they have weapons that can be useful at all ranges and in almost any situations, and they're useful enough that you can put them to be doing almost anything and they'll probably succeed. Plus, a big part of being a trooper is that they're expendable, and while the Centurion did have its production facilities destroyed, there were so many of them early on that you could throw dozens of them to their death in an assault and it really wouldn't make much of a difference, and the damage that they would do during that operation would vastly outweigh the loss of the mechs themselves. So that's where we get our Centurion, as a frontline main battle mech that does a little bit of everything and can be put almost anywhere. And it... It may have been a little too good at its job, actually, considering the kinds of things that people put onto it, just... Like, what in the name of God are you doing? 
to, to put this in a little bit of context, because we're going to start talking about the technical details now, they turned this thing into a monstrosity. Like, they would have genuinely been better off just building new mechs to do some of the stuff that they built the uh, various different models of the Centurion to do, but what can you say? It was a lovely design and people didn't want to get rid of it, so straight off into the insanity we go, we'll dive directly into the chaos. But let's start with something a little normal. The standard Centurion, the original, the 9A, was first put into service in 2801, smack dab in the middle of the First Succession War, at a cost of just under three and a half million sea bills, which is quite a steal for a mech with these kind of capabilities. Equipped with a single autocannon 10 in its right arm, an LRM 10 in its left torso, and two medium lasers right smack in the center. The Centurion has an impressive weapons loadout for a medium mech, squeezing a lot of power out of that 50 ton frame. It also carried 8.5 tons of armor, which made the Centurion a proper brick shithouse for its weight class, able to take a hell of a lot of punishment before taking critical damage or being forced to retreat from the battle. All of this unfortunately came at the expense of speed, which I've mentioned a couple times as the mech could barely hit 64 km per hour on a good day when sprinting and cruised around at about 45 normally, significantly slower than many other contemporaries, and putting it in the speed class of a lot of heavy mechs. It was even too slow, like I mentioned, to keep up with the intended battle buddy, the catapult, so bit of an issue. But since I know everyone that plays the Centurion loves to try and slap the biggest gun possible into the arm, because it's funny, allow me to introduce to you one of the most common early refits in the Centurion's timeline. The Centurion AH, or more accurately, named after the sound that enemy mediums make when they meet this thing in a brawl coming around the corner of a building. The AH reworks the base loadout a bit by removing the medium lasers and replacing the AC-10 with a frankly fucking funny AC-20, the chunkiest gun in the game and in lore. More than enough to outright one-shot pretty much all light mechs, really, with a center torso hit like a good solid shot dead center mass, and kill most mediums with a well-placed round or two, the first one often stripping most of their armor. The AC-20 really is more of an assault mech weapon, considering how stupidly overpowered and close range it is, and the fact that a couple shots from an AC-20 is canonically usually enough to strip the armor from most assault mechs, but, you know, kind of ridiculous. The first major upgrade, rather than refit, of the Centurion was the D variant. The chassis was converted to endosteel, and a 300 rating extra light engine was added on. Together, these freed up enough weight and added enough power to let the Centurion run at a genuinely really impressive 100 kph, just about. It also left a little extra room and tonnage free to upgrade the Autocannon 10 to an LBX variant, so the mech-sized shotgun version, and add Artemis IV guidance system to the LRM. Artemis IV being uh, like a type of missile guidance that dramatically improved the clustering and performance of missiles, as well as how well they tracked targets and stuff. But of course, since there are so goddamn many variants of this mech, everyone and their grandma has a version of this thing, I'm not gonna read out all of them, I'm not gonna cover all of them, instead we're doing a rapid fire comedy round! Mmm! Starting with the D3, triple strength Mimer was added. The mech can now sprint at you at 120 kilometers per hour because it's funny. The D4D, add mask to run even faster at 130 kilometers per hour and upgrade the LRM to a 15 instead of 10. More missiles, more pain, more velocity, more damage from its fist coming straight for your forehead. The D5 can similarly sprint you down at Mach Jesus, but now it has a Rack 5, or for people who know it better as the Giga Big Gatling Cannon that assault mechs like the Atlas III would use. The D9, ferrofibrous armor, a bunch of compact internals, and a shitload of jump jets. The Centurion can now fly or run at you while shooting its new plasma cannon. How fun. Even the skies aren't safe from this mech. Pretty much all the 9H variants are periphery shit heaps, so we'll skip those. Only funny bit is that most of them are built badly, so no atmospheric ceiling. Pray you're deployed on a world with an atmosphere or prepare to suffocate. The Centurion 10s B through W. 
All of them are essentially a new mech since they're 55 tons, freeing up even more weight for armor and guns. Take all of the insanity we talked about for the various 9D variants, then for all the 10 variants, just add more. And that brings us to the Centurion 11s. I said I wasn't going to talk about them till in a different video, but you know, whatever, I'll put them here as like a bonus to the rapid fire thing, whatever. The Centurion 11s, they are Omnipod mechs, or Omnimechs, whatever the correct way to call them were. Essentially, it's a default mech that has a whole bunch of open pods that you can slot weapons into. Now the Centurion is modular. You you can put a whole bunch of SRMs, LRMs, MRMs, multi-missile launchers, a ton of guns if you want to slot in like 15 machine guns, I guess, sure, why not? If you want to put a bunch of really big cannons like a Gauss rifle or an AC-20, go right for it. And then the next day, if you're feeling like Taste of the Rainbow Laser Vomit, you can do that as well. It covers everything and anything under the sun because the Centurion is just a stupid, stupid mech. That was that people will not let die. They keep rebuilding this stupid thing. Every single time a new technology comes out, the first thing the Fed Sons do is make a new variant of the Centurion. Oh my god, there's like 20 of them. What the actual hell? And although I could probably talk about the questionably canon versions that we find in Mech Warrior Online, I'm just gonna settle for the Yen Lo Wang. There are two versions of this special gladiator assault thing monstrosity that takes part in the Solaris gladiator matches. One with an AC-20, which I, I'm, I'm really struggling not to make dicks jokes about that one because the Yenlo Wang. <laughs> and the second version replaces the conventional autocannon with a Gauss rifle three medium pulse lasers, and triple strength Mimer so that when it swings its stupid big arm with its stupid big battle axe, it can use that TSM to split you in half. I will not make another dick joke about that. And that brings me to the last thing I want to talk about for the Centurion. Probably the most notable and iconic thing and what I was rambling about right at the beginning, the shield arm. This is one of those things where if you look up the mech on Google, pretty much every single piece of art or 3D model or whatever that's not like really old is going to include this. But not only are they going to include the arm, they're probably also going to have the pauldron thing up on the shoulder that looks like one of those gladiator armor pieces and the exaggerated helmet style head armor that make the mech actually look like a medieval centurion or like a gladiator or something. This is a non-canon rework of the mech by a company called PGI, and that company gets a lot of hate by diehard purists for introducing many, many non-canon, pure garbage, fantasy weird things into the setting. And, uh, you know, that's fair, I can see that, but, uh, like, I don't care. This is canon for the Centurion now. The PGI version looks infinitely cooler and more distinct than the recent redesign by Catalyst Games Lab, or anything that came out of the old models for tabletop. It looks so badass, and with how the Centurion's weapons are laid out across most of the variants, it even makes more sense than the real canon version. The actual one is kinda bland, and I mean, Centurions almost never have anything significant in their left arm, it's almost always just dead space. Very occasionally, you'll get like a laser in there or something. So the idea of putting a big combat shield on there, extending some armor plating to shield the cockpit from the side, and using that side of the mech as sacrificial armor just kinda makes sense. Like, normally the Centurion's firepower is like three quarters in the center torso and right arm, plus several versions of it, like the Yen Lo Wang, have actually added that shield on. I think that's where the uh, redesign come from, is the Yen Lo Wang actually does have that shield in canon, but it also puts a bunch of melee weapons in that arm. And doing it like that further increases the mech's brawling ability. If you're going to put it into an urban environment, makes it a hell of a lot scarier for mechs that are significantly bigger than it with the one-two punch of a very big gun and, uh, well, a very big punch. It's really cool, it just makes sense, the design is better for it, and from an in-universe perspective, it just makes the mech work even better or fit even better into its role. As far as I'm concerned, that should be the canon design of the Centurion. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Some of the arguments are like, make the torso a little bit less fat. And yeah, I can kind of agree with that. But on the other hand, the PGI version looks like the Centurion is doing nothing but push-ups for entertainment whenever it's not on the battlefield, and like it fist fights assault mechs for fun. 
or bench presses assault mechs for fun. It's really, really chunky, and I love that design element. And with that, we're pretty much done the video. Longtime viewers will notice over the course that there are slightly changed visuals and addition of more video segments than I normally do, as in more than zero. So that's another step in the channel's overhaul, and there's some more stuff coming soon. Soon as in right now. The patron thanks has also been reworked a little bit. And speaking of, to all the people I conned into giving me, er, uh, all the generous people putting up with my shit and donating to the Psy Staying Alive fund over on Patreon, I appreciate you all greatly. Thank you very much. The coffee vendors powering my endless war against sleep, the food merchants trying to revive my missing co-host by cramming stale bread down his throat, and the new arms dealers allowing me to acquire all the toys and tools I talk about in these videos. Like the Centurion I now have parked on my lawn. Thanks, guys. Every patron is now in an end of video scroll, like on the side of the screen, wherever I decide to put it. And the other change, everyone regardless of rank gets their names read when they first join the Patreon, regardless of what tier they join at. Because any money, even like $2.50, is a lot for people to pledge to a random stranger on the internet. Not on rejoin though, I'm not letting people farm that. And this time around, huge thanks to Mars3000, Skylord, and Tony Principe. This was mostly done to save time reading every patron name, as that was getting close to like two minutes of just reading, and, and that's that's a little much. So going forward, this is only going to be like 20 to 30 seconds if I do it right and don't have the whole rolling explanation. And that's pretty much that. The videos are over, outros are hard, let me know if you agree with my hot take on the Centurion's aesthetics and the different models they have and stuff. I will be talking about the Omnimech version in another video where I talk about all Intersphere Omnimechs. Outros are hard, goodbye!